So, my name is Morgan M. Page. Many of you fabulous people know who I am already, but for those of you who don't know of my amazingness, I am a performance artist, a video artist, a writer, an activist, blah, 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 blah. I kind of do a little of everything. Um, and before we start, um, I guess I should talk a little bit about Wendy. So, I met Wendy back in 2008 at the corner of Homewood and Maitland when we were counter protesting the Homewood Maitland Safety Association who were attacking and attempting to drive trans sex workers out of their neighborhood. For shame. But I wasn't sure. It's kind of like faux band camp vest with a little sparkly boob cover and just something to cover my crotch. It all comes together, you know? Um, <laughs> so, this hat is what I was wearing. Not just this hat, there was a whole outfit, I promise, but this hat is the only surviving piece of what I was wearing the first night I met Wendy, um, right there at Homewood and Maitland, and I wore it pretty much every time I saw her, actually. I was very obsessed with this hat for a long time. And it may look like a police officer's hat, but it's actually Canada Post, which I learned very randomly when I was on a train going to Ottawa. This guy, who called himself a postie, told me that apparently this is a hat from like the 1940s. Who knew? Also, who knew there was such a thing as posties? Can we have a moment for this dress and how horrendous it is? <laughs> you all seem to love it. I bought this dress for $30 uh, in the basement of Holt Renfrew for another performance I did in Montreal that was just terrible. The performance was great. The outfit was awful. Um, maybe it's worse if I have the matching opera length gloves on. I don't know. Better? I think better. Um, <laughs> yet another relic from performances past. Um, so one of the things I really loved about Wendy was how much she loved trans women. More than any other person that I know in Toronto who isn't a trans woman, Wendy really, really believed in the power and strength of trans women. And she constantly blew me away. She had so many close trans women friends, unlike anyone else in this friggin' city, because let's be real, lots of people, not actually that trans woman inclusive, but Wendy always was. <laughs> So during that performance, I just did not have enough time to put on a full outfit. She's too fast, that one. Um, <laughs> vision in red. Um, red is the international color for sex workers. And I'm a former sex worker, and that's one of the things Wendy and I had in common. We were both teenagers who were doing fabulous blowjobs. It was really great. I know, right? Is it too many sequins or not enough? I can't tell. I mean, I think maybe it's too many. I just, I need to get out of it. Okay, okay. Our final performer is just hot off from speaking at Slut Walk and having her first film premiere at Inside Out yesterday. Very exciting. Please welcome to the stage me. <laughs> Four cocks. One. You're not putting that inside me. This is the first thing I said when I saw Chris's cock. He was my first for real boyfriend, if you don't count Des, whose coked up punk boy cock drooped about uselessly. Chris had the opposite problem. It was giant and rock solid. <laughs> to this day, one of the biggest cocks I've ever attempted to suck. Chris was a bit of a prick but he was tall, handsome, and had a car. All the things I wanted in a big gay boyfriend at age 16. Our friends hooked us up because we were the only queer kids they knew, so we met up at a Tim Hortons and went back to his parents' house to fuck. He kept saying that he was only into girls and telling me to keep this a secret, but when I saw his gigantic cock, disproportionate to even his towering six foot five inch figure, I knew that I'd have to make a point of telling every single person who would listen. <laughs> I've always been a bit of a bragger. But I was right. It was just too big. We tried and tried, but to no avail. There was no way that he was going to get that inside me. My little glitter-covered gender weirdo ass was too tight, and my throat gagged at even the thought. Being a size queen was clearly not for me. Two. 
I was just walking down the street. Walking down the street as a gender weirdo is a bit complicated sometimes, though. Out of nowhere, this older guy starts walking with me. What's your name, he asks. Where are you going? He's short, balding, a little chubby. Typical middle-aged white dude in Hamilton. He kept chatting me up, and somehow, between shared looks and pauses, we worked out that we were going to have sex for pay. You always expect Johns to drive cars, shitty four-door sedans, or expensive penis mobiles. You never expect them to just be walking around. <laughs> we made our way up the stairs to the roof of Jackson Square, Hamilton's premier place to buy drugs and cheap clothing, located in the heart of rundown downtown. He led me by the hand around corners and into a little alcove. I got down on my knees, unbuttoned his fly, and pulled out the smallest cis cock I have ever seen in my life. It was a stub of a thing, oozing free cum onto my hand. Do you have any condoms, I asked, trying to be the responsible whore. Oh yeah, he said, and rummaged around in his pocket. He found what he was looking for and pulled out a box of Trojans. Magnum size. <laughs> it is a testament to my strength of will that I didn't laugh. Deep breath in, and out, in, and out. He slid the oversized condom onto his prick and it hung there with enough room to put another cock inside. I decided to give it the good college try though because we were already here and he was paying. I sucked and sucked with the condom now filled more with pre-cum than cock sliding around and nearly coming off. I didn't think we were getting anywhere because by this point I wasn't even sure if I had any of his cock in my mouth or just a pre-cum filled condom. But eventually he made a sort of quick grunting noise and upon inspection I could see that his grey pre-cum was mixed with jizz. I know, right? Lesson learned. Always bring your own supply of condoms, even when you're not working or cruising. Three. Three, not four. Three. We fumbled around with each other on a friend's bed. New Year's. I could see the sun coming up behind your head on one side and our two friends half sleeping, half watching on the other. We'd both taken M and were coming down. And let me just say now that I'm sorry for being so uncoordinated gassy and passive the whole time. I just can't have sex on drugs. Your cock was made of three gloved fingers and you asked me where I wanted it. I told you that I wanted you inside my pussy and you pushed them in deep. You'd been scoping me out for hours negotiating whether or not you could fuck me with your partner in French so I wouldn't understand. And I'd been wanting you for months since we met at some coke-filled party in a tiny storefront bar in Toronto. The hen house, by the way. <laughs> What a waste of all that build-up. Neither of us got off, but I gave you one of my very best faked orgasms. You worked that cock and I loved it, so maybe it was the drugs. Frankly, I'm embarrassed. And so I'd like to defend my sexual reputation and give you a chance to defend yours by challenging you to a formal rematch. You choose the place and time and I will fuck your world. Right? Four. The sex party got shut down ten minutes after we arrived. I had just enough time to make out with another activist from Toronto, and all 50 of us had to exit the cramped hotel room. I waited in the hallway for my friend to come out. Want to go back to your place and make out, I asked. Sure, he said, but I'm bringing these three guys with us. Score. After we got to his room, all five of us, and went through the awkward and complicated consent negotiation that each of us, being feminist social justice type people, required, we all got naked and before me was a literal buffet of cock. From left to right, I had Theo, a dominant tattooed top whose cock was just starting to sprout after two months of testosterone. Next to him was little Jacob, a bear cub whose metacock was hard and red, with possibly the world's smallest testicular implants, the size of Cadbury's mini eggs. <laughs> and then Augusto, blonde muscle hunk dom top whose cock had been particularly blessed by testosterone. And finally Ty, who was somewhat alarmingly large in the surgically constructed cock department. I had never been around such a variety of cock before, or since. 
And then the games began. The two tops, Theo and Augusto, took turns alternating between holding me down and fucking me while Ty lost his post-op virginity to Jacob with the mini balls. After a while, I fucked Theo with my fingers while the other three watched and discussed how I gave good facial expressions. I'm not used to getting comments from the peanut gallery while fucking people, but I took it in stride. And here's how I somehow got blamed for getting blood all over the bed. You have to realize that my love of fisting is something I'm very vocal about. But I want to set the record straight on this one. I did not fist that man and get blood on the bed. Ty, whose room we were in, went off into the little bathroom to piss, and while he was in there, Bear Cub Jacob was fisting Augusto's front hole, and I was totally on the other side of the bed, getting fucked by Theo. It was Jacob who made Augusto bleed all over the bed, but Ty has blamed me ever since. I finally slipped out of there once the sex turned into a surgical Q&A, with each guy poking at and asking about Ty's phalloplasty results. The sexy vibe just doesn't carry over into clinical medical talk for me. NMK, not my kink. Thank you. Right? <laughs> so, that draws our performances to a close tonight. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight and sitting through all of my many outfit changes. Um, <laughs> It's lovely to see you all. I hope you will all stay and dance to the amazing beats by Jimmy Lamore upstairs. Um, yeah, so have a good night.